but now we have to go on and then I will uh, invite uh, the second lecture of this session, which is Dr. Hora Harbe, and uh, she, Hora Harbe, she is academic clinical lecturer and specialist registered in obstetrics and gynecology, uh, working at the Tommy National Miscarriage Center in the Institute of Metabolism and System Research of the University of Birmingham. Hoda, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, uh, Hoda will speak about, uh, is there a place for progesterone in the, in the management of miscarriage? Please, Hoda, you have the microphone. Can you thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and um, I'm delighted to be amongst you all to speak to you today about a subject which is um, uh, very uh, important to me and um, that of the subject of miscarriage. Um, and today the focus of my presentation will be to look at the role of gestro in miscarriage management. Miscarriage is the loss of pregnancy in the first 23 weeks of gestation. It's a very common complication of uh, pregnancy, affecting around one in four pregnancies. We know that it's associated with significant um, adverse uh, effects on uh, women, on their families, in terms of the clinical as well as psychological uh, sick really. Um And we know that one in five women who miscarry have anxiety levels which are similar to those who require outpatient psych psychiatric support. Um, indeed, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is a very prevalent in this population, with women um, even nine months after miscarriage um, presenting with symptoms of PTSD. We also know that uh, depression, clinical depression, is very prevalent in this population, with more than one in three women attending with symptoms of depression. Um, it also poses uh, miscarriage and its complications causes um, significant economic burden um, and um, our experience in the UK has shown that there's an estimated £350 million uh, in terms of costs to the NHS um, to, uh, to manage women who have miscarriage and its complications. So it's, it's uh, unfortunate that um, there is a thinking that miscarriage is a common condition and um, it's just nature's way of dealing with an unhealthy pregnancy and more needs to be done to identify um, potential treatments um, that can help um, prevent these heartbreaking complications of, of a common complication of pregnancy. Um, so I'm fortunate to work with the Tommy's National Miscarriage Centre which is um, dedicated to uh, identifying potential treatments um, uh, for miscarriage. And one of those uh, was the question of whether progesterone can, uh, uh, has a role, um, whether it has a role in miscarriage management. Now, Paul Piet has very eloquently and beautifully uh, already described and discussed the role of progesterone, so I will keep this brief. Uh, progesterone is necessary for the, um, for the development of a successful pregnancy, for the implantation of a embryo. Um, it stimulates uterine growth um, in the mutual differentiation and inhibits my mutual contractions. Um, we uh, know that progesterone um, has a role until the 12 weeks point of gestation where the uh, placenta uh, takes over that dominant role. What we also know from a significant body of evidence is that um, low progesterone in early pregnancy is associated with threatened miscarriage. Um, I want to just talk about a case uh, which many uh, of you probably have seen in, in, in clinical practice of a young woman who sadly had six previous miscarriages. She did, however, have one live birth, um, and that was in a pregnancy which um, she uh, uh, received, in which she received progesterone treatment. She saw a private clinician um, who agreed to give her progesterone and she had a live birth at the end of that pregnancy, a lovely little boy. She then went on to conceive again. Um, this time, uh, she was not given, she was not allowed by her practitioner to have progesterone prescription. Um, and we know certainly from our um, practice in the UK and surveys that we've conducted, that about 90% of clinicians will not offer a prescription of progesterone for pre prevention or treatment of miscarriage which differs to, which we know differs to international practice, 
Um, and indeed, um, in 2013, we did a national, international uh, survey at the FIGO conference, um, which is completely different to, um, to our findings and suggested that 90% of clinicians there would offer prescription for progesterone. But is there an evidence base for it? Um, so this woman returned again to us and um, she was again pregnant. We, um, uh, she demanded a prescription for progesterone um, and we agreed. Uh, and we were so pleased to hear that she had a live birth at the end of that pregnancy. So does that prove that progesterone actually um, you know, leads to a live birth rate? Or is this just case report material? Um, this was a question that, however, we really felt we needed to address. Um, and we therefore um, looked at the existing body of evidence. Now, Cochrane had um, already published a review on this in 2007, and we updated the uh, review findings. What we found was that seven uh, randomised trials looked at the specific question of progesterone use for threatened miscarriage. Um, they were small trials, uh, the largest of which only had approximately 140 uh, um, uh, participants. But the seven trials, which included a total of 740 women, um, uh, and used different progesterone, uh, progesterone agents, showed consistently a trend towards a reduction in miscarriage in those women who, were, who received progesterone. Um, a 47% relative reduction in miscarriage risk, a significant reduction. Um, several years before this, we also did a, uh, a review looking at uh, progesterone for recurrent miscarriage. Um, this included four trials. And again, there was a strong signal there that progesterone could prevent uh, miscarriage in women who had a history of uh, recurrent pregnancy loss. But we also needed to consider whether, uh, uh, the, as well as um, you know, its, its, its potential uh, positive or uh, effects of progesterone, whether it actually can, um, whether there's a risk, um, increased risk of miscarriage in those women who had previous miscarriages. Um, and as you can see from this figure, um, women who had previous miscarriages, uh, no previous miscarriages, or one previous miscarriage, the risk of subsequent pregnancy loss is not increased. However, in that population who had two or three previous miscarriages, you start to see a trend um, towards a, an increased risk of miscarriage. And certainly, by the time they've had five or more miscarriages, their risk of a subsequent pregnancy loss is up to 50%. An important study was published by a August Wara more than that was almost 21 years ago. Um, and in this study, they examined the uh, chromosomal abnormality rate in products of conception from women uh, who had a history of recurrent uh, miscarriages. Um, and uh, what they found, and, and particularly looking at it in terms of the number of previous miscarriages, and what they found was that the uh, those women who had Euclid miscarriages were increased, had more subsequent pregnancy losses compared to those uh, um, women who had pregnancies with um, aneuploid um, carry time. And it's in those women, so we can see that the Euclid miscarriage rate increases with the number of previous miscarriages. It's in that group that we um, suspected that progesterone could potentially have a beneficial effect. So we set out to uh, conduct two um, randomised control trials, uh, looking, looking at two distinct questions. The first was, does giving progesterone to women with a history of recurrent miscarriage prevent subsequent miscarriages? And the second question was whether progesterone could be used as a rescue treatment in those women who were pregnant, and who were diagnosed with a threatened miscarriage, i.e. those who came in with early pregnancy bleeding, does progesterone at that point, um, can it potentially reduce their risk of having a miscarriage? So starting off with the PROMISE trial, um, this was a, an international trial um, which looked at first trimester progesterone use in women who had 
previous miscarriages. So, um, and these were women who were trying to conceive naturally. Um, we randomised them into either um, progesterone in the form of 400 milligrams um, progesterone to be administered twice daily vaginally from no later than six weeks until 12 weeks gestation. The comparison group was uh, this group who received placebo. And the primary outcome of interest was life birth beyond 24 weeks. Um, the sample size or the target sample size was 790 women um, and we randomised 825 women in this study. The study was conducted across sites in the UK and in the Netherlands. So what did we find? So um, the live birth rate um, after 24 weeks in the progesterone group was 66% um, compared with 63% in the placebo group. Rather disappointingly, this was not statistically significant, but suggested a 3% relative increase in the live birth rate. The, um, the findings were uh, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine um, as a negative study. But a very important observation um, that came out of the study is when we looked at this, um, when we did a subgroup analysis to look at the effectiveness of progesterone in women with higher order miscarriage. Um, and this uh, um, figure here shows the um, risk or the, uh, the live birth rate in women who had four or more previous miscarriages. And what you can see is that progesterone treatment um, in fact increased their live birth rate in that, in that uh, higher older miscarriage group. Um, and we can see that by number of uh, previous miscarriages, there is again a trend toward an increase in live birth rate um, with increasing number of previous miscarriages. So moving on from the promise study, uh, we, there, um, we designed a further study looking at the second question, whether progesterone um, could be used as a rescue, rescue treatment. And this was um, in response to a call by the NICE guidelines um, who, um, who wanted a definitive answer um, of, of this question. And they called for a large randomized control trial to specifically address whether progesterone given in early pregnancy or early pregnancy bleeding can reduce the risk of miscarriage and increase the live birth rate. So the population of interest was um, any woman presenting with early pregnancy bleeding during the first 12 weeks just of gestation. We randomised them to either receiving progesterone in the form of uh, eutrogestan 400 milligrams twice daily um, until 16 completed weeks of gestation. The, the other, uh, the comparative group received the placebo, and our primary um, outcome of interest was life birth beyond 34 at a little bit two weeks. Um, the target sample size was 4,150 women, um, uh, which we were successful in, um, in randomizing. Um, just a quick note about early pregnancy bleeding why is this important? Um, well, we know that 20% of women uh, in pregnancy will have early pregnancy bleeding before 12 weeks. Um, we see in clinical practice, women will often be referred um, to us very distressed at the sight of blood. It's not always a sign of a problem. However, we do know that a third of these women will go on um, to um, have a miscarriage. So uh, we set out to do this uh, trial, um, which we conducted across uh, 48 sites in the UK. Um, and um, we were funded by the NIHR and supported by the Birmingham Clinical Trials Unit and Thomas Charity. <laughs> what we found was that the live birth rate um, at 34 weeks and beyond uh, in the progesterone group was 75% compared with 72% in the placebo group. Um, this suggested 54 extra babies in the progesterone group um, compared with um, those women who were in the placebo group. Now again, as with the promised trial, we didn't find a, a statistically significant difference, but what we found was that this translated into 54 women who took their babies home. Now, 
we also in our um, statistical plan prior to the um, study had pre-specified subgroups and we were interested to see whether um, the number of previous miscarriages had any impact on um, treatment effects. And what you can see is that in women who had no previous miscarriages, there was no difference in um, progesterone treatment compared to placebo. In those who had one to two previous miscarriages, there was a signal there with 76% of women who received progesterone having a high birth rate compared to 72%. What was particularly striking was that those who had three or more previous miscarriages, the live birth rate was 72% in the progesterone group compared with 57% in the placebo group. And this was strongly statistically significant. Um, when you combine all of the groups, any woman who's had one or more previous miscarriage had a higher live birth rate, 75% of progesterone compared with placebo. We can see a powerful biological gradient um, in these women. And then this um, shows similar um, uh, findings as those um, observed with the promise results. So consistently find the <coughs> previous number of miscarriages um, uh, and, and progesterone treatment can potentially increase the risk of live birth rate um, in, in those women. And this again uh, compares with, the, with that study we discussed earlier about that group which could potentially benefit um, the euploid miscarriages where we can potentially rescue those pregnancies. We combined our um, study findings uh, and incorporated them in an uh, updated uh, systematic review. And again, here you can clearly see that the live birth rate, uh, the, the uh, women who received progesterone uh, had a higher live birth rate benefit from treatment um, in the threatened miscarriage or rescue treatment uh, setting, um, as well as those who had previous recur or recurrent miscarriages, again, a benefit was demonstrated when we, when we incorporated our study findings for promise and present trials. Um, and Paul has already also discussed safety concerns uh, with regards to the use of progesterone. Um, and this slide here um, shows our experience through the promise and present trials. Uh, and what um, we found was that the uh, rates of progenitor abnormalities not differ between those women who receive progesterone compared with placebo in the promise trial um, and in the prison trial again no difference in congenital normality rates between the two groups with a rate of 3.3 percent there was also no um, difference in the um, in, in the number of women who uh, opted for termination of pregnancies in the progesterone group compared with uh, placebo treatment um, we published um, a, an expert review on the findings of PRISM um, in the American Journal of Office and um, to discuss how we can actually interpret these findings into clinical uh, and translate them into clinical practice. Um, we also published a study, um, so alongside the randomised controlled trial, we called um, an economic uh, evaluation to look at the added costs or the cost effectiveness of progesterone in, um, in, in treating women with early pregnancy bleeding. And, and what this showed was that there was a positive impact with progesterone use with a small additional or added cost um, to treatment. Um, and there was an incremental benefit with number of previous miscarriages um, uh, with progesterone use. Um, what, in simple terms, what the prison class has, has has shown is that we could potentially prevent 8,000 pregnancy losses, which means 8,000 more babies being born each year, and um, um, uh, and we welcome the support of the Royal College of Health and Gynae, who tweeted this lovely tweet, um, and we hope that this will um, translate into clinical practice um, uh, and help with it. So what should we be doing now? Um, so we did a uh, we conducted a UK wide survey to look at the um, progesterone use uh, amongst clinicians, and what this showed was that um, in 160 surveyed uh, clinicians, 
almost 90% of them prior to the prison study, um, did not offer progesterone. Um, following prison findings, 75% um, of clinicians said that they would be happy to and uh, um, or already were given progesterone to women who presented with miscarriage. Um, the NICE guidance, uh, got NICE guidelines are currently the um, committee are currently updating their guidance and considering the findings of the prison um, trial. They published this um, update which said that in their upcoming guideline they will focus on progesterone in treating threat and miscarriage and we hope that they will incorporate incorporate the findings of prison um, in, with the ultimate hope that we can help more women. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we would like to thank all of the trial participants in the UK National Miscarriage Research Network, NIHR for funding this important work, and Tommy's for continuing to fund the important research in this area. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you, Dr. Harb, for the beautiful and exhaustive presentation showing so beautiful data. And also, the last uh, uh, figure that you have done on the changes in the general use of progesterone this tell that we are, you are going really in the direct way. I would like to invite uh, uh, Paul Piet to come also with us because we have now the time of uh, questions for this uh, uh, presentation before to move uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the magistral lecture of Dr. Di Renzo later on. Please, Paul, are you here? Yes, I am with you. Okay, if you can open. If you can uh, stop your uh, your uh, screen sharing. Okay, thank you very much. And then we have the questions. We have received several questions. I would like, first of all, to make you all the compliments for the beautiful data. And then uh, I would like, first question is for Paul. Eh? Progesterone can be administered by several routes of administration. When uh, to recommend oral, vaginal, or transdermal? <laughs> So that's a very interesting question. You know, uh, there are several ways to try to answer the question, but uh, to keep it simple and to be pragmatic, I think that at the end of the day, there is no huge difference between the China or the oral route of administration. But for sure, uh, we have to think about where the progesterone is supposed to be active and efficient. And it makes sense that, for example, in pregnancy madness, we are focusing on the implantation process, the endometrium, and probably we uh, will prefer to obtain optimal, constant, and high progesterone level at the tissue level into the endometrium. And that's why the vaginal route of administration is the preferred route of administration when it goes on progesterone and pregnancy maintenance. But for sure, there are some indications, for example, in HRT for menopause hormone therapy, where there are many reasons to administrate progesterone, because as you may know, it's not just a matter to protect the endometrium uh, to the risk of hyperplasia or uh, adenocarcinoma induced by estrogen, but there's a plenty of other effect of progesterone on uh, sleep improvement, uh, bone uh, preservation, bone loss preservation, uh, quality of life uh, outcomes. And in this domain, I think that the oral route of administration is more uh, adequate because women will have to take the progesterone for a long term more than at least uh, 10 years, if you look at the guidelines, but there is no arbitrary limitation in the duration of treatment in HRT. So for me in HRT, and that was nicely addressed in the replenish study recently in the US, where continuous combined treatment with oral estradiol 1 milligram and 100 milligram oral progesterone is uh, an optimal regimen in terms of benefit risk. Uh, in menopausal women. So for, for menopause indication, oral rule administration is probably mandatory in, in first intention. But some women, as you mentioned, Andrea, are uh, liver sensitive to some steroid metabolism, not only progesterone, but 
estradiol or contraception. And for those women, it's for sure a good option to move from the oral intake to the vaginal route of administration. In terms of pharmacodynamics and safety and uh, pharmacokinetic, we can consider that about 600 milligram vaginal progesterone is equivalent to 800 milligram oral progesterone. So if you want to move to oral to vaginal progesterone, you have to decrease a little bit the daily dose to be equally uh, effective in terms of pharmacodynamics. That's at least my experience. This is a very important point. Eh? It's also something new because it's not so clear for everybody that the vaginal administration can reach a concentration which are even higher than oral administration. And then now we have a, a question for uh, Dr. Harb. And the question is, uh, um, could progesterone treatment increase the risk of continuing pregnancy in chromosomically un uh, unviable fetus? Um, I think that's a really important question, and it was one that we um, had looked at when we were design the, designing the PRISM trial. Um, the existing evidence doesn't suggest that progesterone will support a pregnancy with a chromosomally abnormal fetus. Um, we looked at 38 trials prior to the PRISM um, trial, which again did not show an increase in the rate of chromosomally abnormal uh, neonates. And certainly from our experience with PROMIS, the rates did not differ between the two groups. Where we, we um, thought and, and feel that progesterone is of benefit is in those uh, pregnancies where there's a euploid um, uh, of healthy pregnancy that, that, that's developing. We also looked at, of course, with PRISM, our congenital abnormality rates did not differ between the two. Um, whilst actually doing the uh, study, we had charged the data monitoring committee to look at the rates, and again, they didn't find any increased risk. Um, and of course, fortunately, we also have a, a national screening program to look at the um, uh, anomaly rates and, and screen pregnancies antenatally between 11 and 14 weeks, and again at 20 weeks. Um, and, and, and therefore, there's always a system in place to, to look at whether we, we use that as a backup sort of system to see whether in the progesterone group we were increasing these pregnancies with um, annual um, or chromosomally abnormal um, pregnancies, and that was not the case. Thank you. And then now for Paul, we have a question from Carmen Carina Flores Gonzalez. I will translate. She's asking, what are the risks for the fetus uh, to give a treatment of with progesterone to the mother during the first trimester? But I, I think that uh, Oda was uh, addressing this question uh, nicely, and the only way to have a, a well-evidenced uh, answer to this question is to look at placebo control study. And if you cannot identify an increase in uh, fetus adverse events, uh, when you compare blinded the active group and the placebo group, there is no reason to believe that uh, there is any uh, safety uh, concern in the fetus when you administrate uh, vaginal progesterone. Uh, by the way, uh, progesterone is the hormone of pregnancy at the condition that you are not making some confusion between progesterone and very close molecule or synthetic progestogen, which are uh, delivering totally different pharmacodynamic profile, as I mentioned during my presentation. So for sure on the fetus, there is no uh, signal, uh, pharmacovigilance signal, suggesting that there is any risk for the fetus administrating progesterone in the early pregnancy. And even Mary Stephenson in the US is highly recommending to start progesterone as early as possible in women at risk for threatened miscarriage or for women uh, who uh, will benefit for progesterone. So or earlier you start progesterone, the better probably. Thank you. And then one question for uh, Dr. Harb. How could clinician caring for women with recurrent miscarriage incorporate the findings of PRISM trial into clinical practice? 
Sure. So uh, what we have already started to incorporate these findings in our practice um, in the current miscarriage clinic. So uh, we run a national miscarriage uh, clinic and receive referrals from all across the UK. Um, and our recommendations are that in any woman, based on the promise and prison um, findings, any woman who has had four or more uh, previous miscarriages should receive a prescription for progesterone in the form of 400 milligrams twice daily from positive pregnancy test until 16 completed weeks um, of pregnancy as a routine. So as soon as she has a pregnancy, positive pregnancy test, she can see her GP or to, to attend our clinic and we will offer a prescription. And for those women who have had one or more previous miscarriages, um, who are pregnant and have early pregnancy bleeding, again, we would advise them to see their GP or to come and see us and we would give them a prescription for progesterone, again, to complete until 16 weeks. Thank you. And then one for um, Paul. Paul, the question is, is the safety of exogenous progesterone intake the same in function of the route of administration? But uh, as long as you take progesterone when you need progesterone, meaning that you make some replacement, and that's true, for example, in hormone replacement therapy or in pregnancy madness is the same, uh, if you maintain the correct balance between estradiol and progesterone, uh, there is uh, no uh, safety issue uh, independently of the route of administration. So the, the only uh, big difference between both routes of administration is the metabolism in allopregnanolone, which is quite more intensive when you take oral progesterone comparing to the vaginal route. And as you may know, the effect of allopregnanolone on the brain is a complicated uh, effect. It, it's a bimodal effect. It's depending. You have you can have some mood swings and some adverse events with very low dose of allopregnanolone or even with very high dose of allopregnanolone, but I think that you, Andrea, you are an expert in allopregnanolone, so you can probably better address this question. Uh, but uh, overall, we have to be careful with the fluctuation in allopregnanolone levels because we cannot control really the, the, the brain effect at the individual level. So again, uh, if you want to benefit from brain effects, I should recommend to take progesterone by the oral route because in menopausal hormone therapy, sleep improvement is a very huge problem. And we did a randomized placebo control study administrating 300 milligrams oral progesterone at bedtime and you decrease the hot flashes to sleep uh, the, the hot flash during the night, but also you improve sleep. So, so then in, this, in those cases, some women will benefit from oral progesterone and the brain effect. But for the, the pregnancy maintenance, I think that definitely the vagina route of administration is the first okay. choice. Okay. And then now uh, one question for Dr. Harb. This is related as the, until I will translate, uh, is uh, from, the, from Dr. Cagliotti, Tricagliotti. Uh, until when, until wh what week uh, you have to maintain the treatment with progesterone to prevent abortion, and when to start for the risk of premature delivery? Um, so in terms of um, the early, uh, so those women who have a history of four previous miscarriages, you start it as soon as they have a pregnancy test and you continue the treatment until they have completed 16 weeks um, uh, of pregnancy. Um, and in those who have one or more previous miscarriages, but less than four, um, they will receive a prescription if they have early pregnancy bleeding and they will continue the treatment until 16 weeks can be the gestation again. And for and the other part, and then for the prevention of premature delivery. So the PRISM trial didn't look at this um, uh, this, this uh, outcome, um, and um, I, I suppose the optimum trial would be the one to, to refer to. I'm not sure how long they continued it then, but we feel beyond 16 weeks, um, uh, it is unlikely to, 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 um, to continue to provide that effect for early pregnancy. And, 
whole this is a question for you and in prevention of premature delivery what should be the dosage of uh, vaginal so, so uh, uh, where you still have important concentration of progesterone so this is a, a very good question and uh, uh, there is no real good trial to address the optimal initiation of progesterone but for sure as as soon as you identify for example a short cervix uh, uh, so soon you have to initiate your progesterone intake the problem is that the clear cut of level for the short cervix or the cervix measurement is in between 18 and 24 weeks of gestation. So usually we measure the cervix around week uh, 16, 18 earliest until week 34 and if there is a short cervix we measure, we, we initiate immediately the progesterone until week 37 of gestation. In case of a history of previous uh, preterm births, then we will uh, initiate the progesterone, for example, at week 16 or 18, and we will maintain the treatment for with 200 milligrams daily dose, vaginally administrated until week 37. But so the, the question is uh, when to measure the cervix, and there, there are uh, some good evidence that uh, the cutoff level of 25 millimeter which was used in the optimum trial by Jay Norman the 25 millimeter uh, was the, the cut the well accepted cutoff level to be measured in between week 18 to week 24 some uh, studies are suggesting even to measure the, the cervix at week 16 but there is no real definitive evidence on that, but probably that Giancarlo event, so we can address this question also in the plenary lecture. Okay, then I have one question is that one. And concerning the, in the recent time, the women that are coming to pregnancy, they are sometime of very high age, high, very high reproductive age. Then, in these women, over 40s, who are looking for pregnancy, once they are pregnant, do you believe that we can start uh, vaginal progesterone support of the luteal phase since the beginning or we have to wait uh, any symptom? So um, in the PRISM trial, we didn't uh, include, uh, we had the upper cutoff of 39 age, uh, um, uh, years of age because we didn't, above the age of 40, the rate of chromosomal abnormal uh, pregnancies is, is significantly higher, so it's 50% or more, and it's in, in that population, progesterone is, is unlikely to be of benefit. Um, so, but we do offer women who are um, 40 and above who present with early pregnancy bleeding uh, progesterone prescription. Based on the PROMISE trial, we, we didn't offer it as a preventative um, treatment from the outset, um, unless, of course, they had four or more previous miscarriages. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, then we are approaching to the end. I would like now to ask each one of you to give, uh, not, a, not a summary, but to give a message, to give a message concerning safety, efficacy of progesterone in, you were also mentioning outside of pregnancy and in pregnancy. Please, Paul, if you can start, and uh, Dr. Harvey will conclude. Please, Paul. Thank you, Andrea. So the key message first is not to con be confused in between natural progesterone and progestogen overall. Uh, there is a huge of misinformation in even the recent publication. And for example, in the US, they are often mentioning progesterone for, for a synthetic progestin or for medroxyprogesterone acetate. So my first message is don't be confused in between progesterone, natural progesterone, and synthetic progestogen, even digesterone, this small, uh, this uh, closed molecule of progesterone, has totally different pharmacodynamic characteristics. The second point is to look at the optimal route of administration and going for the vaginal route for pregnancy indication and to keep as a first intention the oral progesterone for uh, menopausal hormone therapy or uh, regular to regulate the cycle or other gynecological indication and if there is an 
an intolerance to oral progesterone because uh, some drowsiness or dizziness that can occur when you take more than four or six hundred milligrams progesterone a day, which is the case in threatened and recurring miscarriage, then you have to move definitely from oral to vaginal route of administration. Thank you. And Dr. Harm? Um, my key message is essentially progesterone is a cheap, cost-effective, beneficial treatment for miscarriage and can reduce the heartbreak for many women and their families. Please, please consider requirement for progesterone for those women who are eligible uh, for progesterone treatment. And thank you. Thank you very much.